Uh, could you do us a favor and just say your name and can you spell your name for the recorder? Okay. All of it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nancy Ikuya Nkunsa, N-A-N-C-Y. Then Ikuya is A-K-U-A. Nkunsa is N-K-U-M-S-A-H. Okay. And can you just confirm for us that you read over the uh, uh, deed of gift and the other informed consent paper? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, and you don't have any questions about those? Mm -mm. Awesome. So we can get started. Um, just a uh, full warning, um, I shouldn't be making any sort of verbal kind of cues when you're uh, talking, so I'll just nodding and smiles and thumbs up, uh, just so that way I don't interrupt you or have my voice interfere with yours on the recording. Okay. All right. So uh, just starting at the beginning, um, where are you from? I'm originally born in Ghana, West Africa, and I came here at the age of five years old, here as in America. Yeah. I was raised in Bronx, New York. Okay. Um, from that age till sophomore year of high school. Um, then my family moved down to New Jersey, and then from high school, master's, Jersey. Then after I got my master's, I got a job here at IEP, so Pennsylvania. Uh, do you have any memories from when you were growing up in Ghana and then eventually in New York, I think you said next? Yeah. Um, not too much because I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I guess certain, uh, the memories, I learned English was my second language, so she was my first language and I still understand and um, speak it. Not as great, but as for a 29 year old not having to live there for a while, um, but I'm doing pretty well. Um, memories wise, uh, not in Ghana, but in New York, since all my schooling, most of my schooling was there. Um, my first friends, um, different things like that. That's my experiences. Um, I don't know. When it comes to in New York growing up, um, we lived in apartments. Like my first, our first house was in New Jersey. So growing up in the city, South Bronx, um, living in apartments and then finally I remember when my family moved down to New Jersey and I came down with them I couldn't sleep at night because it was too quiet so it was a big adjustment for me um, but it was just the noise the just the diversity as well which kind of disappeared after we moved down to South Jersey we lived in Pensacola. Um so a lot of the diverse individuals that I grew up with that kind of started disappearing um, as we moved to more, I guess, suburban areas. Um, uh, crazy thing too that I remember growing up is um, I was learning Spanish and a lot of my friends were Hispanic and so I was picking up the language. Um, so in class, in school, I was doing well because my friends around me, they would speak it, their parents would speak it and different things and that got lost <laughs> when I moved down to Jersey and it really got lost by the time I started college. Um, but yeah, it, that's the one thing I wish I it, it would have been still around. And of course the food, the pizza, the subways, like the bus. I haven't sat in a bus, like a city bus. I probably sat in it once in South Jersey, but like to like ride it, the subway, I missed that aspect because everything was accessible and it, it's more happening. But once you move down to suburban area, it was just everybody kept to themselves. They had their houses, um, kids had cars, <laughs> so I had to learn how to drive. Um, and then later on I got a car, but it was a different, it was a very different flip. Um, I played basketball for the longest time, so sports was big with me. Um, played basketball for a while, and then my freshman year in high school, I got into art and design, high school in Manhattan. Um, so I would take the train and walk several blocks to school, but because it's Manhattan, the school was built up, and we had about eight, 
eight floors, I believe. Um, and knowing how Manhattan is, you have to take trains and bus just to get to like Central Park for us to play or a different um, field for us to play. But we will practice um, on the roof of the school. <laughs> there was fencing around it. Um, but of course, if somebody hit it over, if you were through, it went over the fence and we would just stop and listen to see if like we hit a car or a person or there was a crash and then we're like, oh, okay, we're good, we're good. And then we just go back to playing. Um, but yeah, the, there's sports, always there's sports. Um, move down to South Jersey, continue with softball, um, pitching, um, basketball. I had to stop because of health issues, um, but was playing softball. I was actually recruited to Rutgers University for softball. We won the championships that year. Um, so that was a fun, hey, you're a freshman championship. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, sports have been part of it. And then, of course, it's just been my education and certain goals that I've set for myself. But yeah, growing up has just been sports, friends, diversity, which kind of went, went away. But um that's what I remember when I think of childhood. Okay. Um, so you kind of elaborated on what you did before your time at IUP. Um, would you like to elaborate more at your time at um, Rutgers? Yeah. Um, Rutgers, I got my undergraduate degree from there. Um, like I said, I played sports. Um, as a student, I was, my parents moved out of the state before I got accepted, and so that's expensive. Um, and my loans say so. Um, but um, spent four years there, I worked two to three jobs to see myself through um, and to also help back at home. Um, yeah, I kind of took care of myself. Um, I got into student affairs. Um, when I started my undergrad and a lot of people would tell you like you just kind of fall into it <laughs> You don't like I'm gonna grow up to be an RD. No, doesn't happen <laughs> um, but I fell into it because the uh, RA they call them RAs here. They're CAs um, um, Told me about it told me about the benefits and because I was also pressed for money and being able to go She's like well your room and board is paid for and you get money and like and like food is paid I'm like, okay, I will work for that um and so that's how i got into student affairs um campus activities and i also did um security on campus um again working whatever jobs i could to kind of see me through um when i was done with my four years there my um the head of housing said hey you were really good in this area um do you ever plan on getting your master's? What do you want to do? Move on. And I said, yeah, sure, I guess, because I don't really know exactly what I want to do, but I like what I'm doing here. And so I applied uh, around and I got my first resident director position in, uh, at Centenary College, which is Centenary University now. It changed a couple weeks ago. Um, as an RD there and it's a small private institution. Funny thing is it's so small that the entire campus, if it was full of students, it's as many students that would be in Putnam Delaney Hall combined, full capacity, 750 could fit on campus. And that's freshman halls, middle campus, and the apartments all together. So <laughs> that was fun when I got here and I got Putnam Delaney Hall. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did two years there, got my master's, and then did a job search. And IUP, I didn't know IUP existed. <laughs> Was it in my radar? No, I, I, what is that? <laughs> um, and a lot of times, especially when I'm talking to people, they were like, oh, Indiana University. Yes, of Pennsylvania. What? <laughs> yes. Um, so I didn't know IUP existed until I was job searching. Um, so IUP came up and it was actually after I did my on-campus interview, it became my top one school. Um, so I did an on-campus interview here and it was my first one and then I went to University of Nebraska, you pit Bradford, you pit Johnstown and I turned down a couple other schools. 
Um, but IEP was like my top and I was like, please let me get this job. So when I got the phone call like, hey, would you accept it? Yes, I will. <laughs> I will be there uh, later on this year. Um, so that's how I got to IEP. Uh, what uh, degree did you get undergraduate from Rutgers? Uh, sociology okay. and I minored in general management. Um, I actually changed my, the summer before my senior year, I changed my major because I couldn't get through stats. I hate stats. Math and me don't work. But, uh, and it's crazy because I went through to get my doctorates and I had to do stats with my, my research. So I could, I guess I couldn't run away from it. But I, at first I thought I was going to be a crim major and crim and business. It wasn't like CSI. So I was like, okay, this is not for me. And then I did business. And because I knew the dean of the business school, um, and he knew I was focused, I just couldn't get past that. I was able to be signed into so many business courses that by my summer, he was like, okay, Nancy, you need to take and pass stats. Or you basically would have passed all the classes in business and never really gotten your, you know, qualified to get in. I was like, well, that should tell you something, but whatever. Um, but after like my first exam in the summer, I was just like, okay, I can't do this. And if I was to get in, um, I, would, I wouldn't be finished in four years. I would have to go another year or a half a year. And I was like, I don't have the money. Um, and so I just walked out of the class. I went to see my advisor and I said, this is all the classes I've taken what can I do? Um, and so he said, okay, you can get a psychology degree or a sociology degree. Um, the difference between the two was psychology was three extra, three more classes than social. So I was like, social it is, we're going to go with that. Um, so I took seven classes my fall semester and six classes my spring semester to be done in four years. <laughs> um, but that's how I got my undergrad in sociology. Okay. Um, what degree, are you working on a degree with IUP currently? No, I just graduated this past May um, with my doctorates in administration and leadership studies. The, yeah, doctors in education one because there's a PhD and the DED. I did the DED route. Uh, what is your current association with the university? Um, I know that you said you worked with housing. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your job and what does that really entail within the university and with the students? Um, I'm a residence director for Stevenson Hall. Um, when I first got here, I was a resident director over in Putnam Delaney, and then I was moved here last summer. Um, but as a resident director, you're basically overseeing the building from facilities to the entire staff, meaning um, some people don't have graduate assistants um, or assistant resident directors within their community, but they oversee graduate assistants who are grads who have their own buildings. Um, currently, I have a assistant resident director and a graduate assistant who oversees um, Suites on Pratt. So I oversee them and their assistantships um, and then their staffs well, for the graduate assistant, their staffs through them. Um, but here, overseeing the entire staff, the building, the residents, um, if you were going to put a hierarchy on it, it'll be me and then like everything kind of falls under me. Um, and then I have um, my boss, well, my direct supervisor who works in housing, Malika Turner, or Dr. Malika Turner. Um, <laughs> um, so it's just running facilities, crisis management, if something happens, parent, handling parent phone calls, um, student issues. A lot of times we train the staff, the student staff, the CAs, community assistants, to be the front, the, like the people that the students go to first. And then typically things can get solved and get out the way, like solved and handled there. Um, and if they need to come to me for me to help them walk through something, they do that. However, if it just gets even further than that, then it'll come to me or I'll assign my assistant resident director to handle it. Um, handle student conduct. So any student that lives within my hall, whether they get arrested off campus, 
in this hall, they get documented or any hall, I have to see them. So um, a lot of times we're in meetings and a lot of times in my free time, I'm creating meetings to meet students. Um, but in addition to that, we're a part of um, department committees. So currently, I am the chair of CA selection, community assistant selection. Um, I'm on winter workshop, which is the second part of training for um, our student staff. Um, and third one, it's like, I think paraprofessional training for next year fall. So we start everything. Yeah, we're always going and doing all of that. So I hope that you know, there's other things too, but. That's about it. <laughs> so I know you said that you found IUP while you were job hunting. Mm -hmm. um, what was it about IUP that put it on your radar? Um, since I was job hun hunting with the, the location I was looking at and um, what kind of caught my eye, they had the, other than Rutgers, because Rutgers is a little more, like pay-wise, they were paying pretty good here um, compared to the other schools that were around it. Um, the location, even though I, I don't mind moving far from home, it's not too bad. It's like a you know, five, five and a half hour drive home to Delaware. Um, and then, but what really sold it for me was when I came to the on-campus interview. Um, it was different than my other ones. Um, oh, I also did Penn State, the main campus. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, but it stood out from all the other on-campus interviews that I had. Um, and the reason being was, one, the campus is beautiful, and they do a good job on this campus to make sure, not just the residence hall, but with the, I guess, res hall revival and how they upkeep the grounds. It's visibly is very appealing um, but when I went through my on-campus interview you you meet students different people from the department to people outside of the department and so of course they ask you questions but I, I was I always ask like okay so what got you here why are you here at IUP in Indiana <laughs> like why would you come out here and one of the things that caught my mind that stuck with me was a lot of people had the idea that they were going to come here, leave in two years or three years, but then 10, 15, 16 years later, they're still IUP. They've been able to develop and grow. They've been able to also, when different job opportunities came up, it was, at least for them, they were fortunate to be able to move up in their career um, and do different um, things. So I was like, well, you guys sound like you're happy to be here. <laughs> um, sadly, that wasn't always the case when I asked questions at other interviews at other institutions. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, I would like to <laughs> come here because in my mind, yeah, I'm going to come work, get a degree, could, and then leave, which I'm still looking for that to do. But like if an opportunity were to open that I'm able to hop on, um, I know that I'll have the opportunity to go out for that position. It's just right now at IUP with what's going on with the freeze and everything, there really aren't any jobs that are popping up right now that I can, with my degree, take and be comfortable in what it's being offered, like the pay. And I always have to think about my family, my loans that are now kicking in and other things. So, yeah. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so what initially led you to IUP in that you wanted to get your degree here rather than maybe just work and make up enough money to go get a degree somewhere else? Um, it's free here. <laughs> it's part of our benefits. Um, and so they pay for your credits and then you as, because I'm part of SCUPA, um, you pay for all the other services. So... But if you were to get it at a different institution, you had they only pay partial. Um, but it worked out. It was like everything was falling into place because I looked into the PhD program and the DED program for ALS, um, the administration leadership. Because I was like, ALS is a disease, isn't it? Um, administration leadership studies. Um, 
um, I looked through both programs and I really wanted to do the DED. But of course, at that point, I wasn't here yet. I was still at my institution. And a lot of people were like, oh, why would you want to get a DED, get the PhD? It's better. I'm like, aren't they both doctors? Like, I don't really understand. Um, and it's like, no, this one is a smidge bigger. I'm like, mm, okay, whatever. So I actually applied. Even though I wanted a DED, I applied for the PhD program. Um, and I went to the open house. And sadly, when I went to the open house, I knew that I wasn't going to be accepted, only because um, I've never stopped going to school. So again, like I defended 10 days before my 29th birthday. So when I when I went to the open house and I sat there and they were like, everybody was going around in a circle, I, I knew that, okay, I'm the youngest person in this room. And then like people are telling their stories and they're like, yeah, I've been out the game for five, 10, 15 years, 20 years. I've done all of this with my life. I'm coming back to get this education. Then it comes to me, I'm like, yeah, I graduated a couple months ago. I would like to get continue my education and stuff like that. Um, well, it so happened that I got, you know, thank you, but you haven't been accepted. Try again later. Um, and like anybody else, I submitted like, is it that my scores weren't good? Um, what could I have done to stand out better? And the response was, um, you need more experience. So why don't you go out, get another master's, and then think about coming back and getting a PhD? No, I don't want to waste my time doing that. Um, so I was able to connect with uh, Bob Millward over for the DED program. Um, and I was able to, I did my interview with him. He got all my transcripts and everything was fine. So he was like, come on board. And I got my doctor's and stuff for another master's. Um, but I really enjoy the DED program. It's excellent. I would always tell, I tell people like, you need to go through this program. And currently I have, well, two staff members who are doing it and a couple other people that I know who are going through the program right now. Like I will always promote that program. It's awesome. Is there anything specific about the program that you really liked in comparison to any others you were looking at? Um, learning, actually learning the difference between getting a PhD and a DED. Um, if you're getting a PhD, you more like at one, at some point you want to be a professor. Um, you're more interested in research and stuff like that. But a DED, you get that and it's more, uh, you want to apply it. You're not really into too much research, but you know how to do research. But I like doing this. Administration work is what I like doing. Um, and so the difference, be knowing the difference between, I knew that I should have just went for this one to begin with, but that's it. Um, but the professors in the program, how the classes are structured, we meet only five times a semester, meaning that every time we meet is six hours a class. But I really like it though, because I rather that than every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're meeting up. Um, and then because of that, it also gives room for individuals who don't live close to also be part of the program. So I think one of the guys in our program, the, he lived the furthest um, five or six hour drive. And so he'll come for the weekend and it's Friday, Saturday, and then it's like, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Um, so I like the fact that it wasn't regular. It was five times a semester. I also like that they help you through the process. So from day one, they're telling you, um, think about your topic. Um, the first things that you start submitting, if you know your topic, um, you can start writing your first chapter. It's not like the PhD program where they teach you through the entire thing and then after you're done with classes, you kind of start doing the paper, like your dissertation by yourself and then you get a you know chair and everything. Um, if you stick with what they tell you, meaning you get a topic, you stick with the topic and then every um, project and everything that you do, you try to make sure it sticks with your topic so you can add to it. By the end of the program, you have, if you didn't work on it a lot, at least the shell of your first three, three out of the five chapters, which helps you, um, helps with the graduation rate being also high. Um, so that's the part about it. The professors, um, the entire program being dedicated to helping you through the process um, and the class structure as well, going back to that. Um, a lot of 
uh, we had readings and different things, but we also did a lot of presentations. We had a lot of um, conversations with each other, whereas you're not going to lecture to me for six hours and expect me to be up. And that's not what they did. It was very engaging. So that helped us out too. Plus they had snacks in the back. So I was happy about that. <laughs> okay. Um, what was your association with the IUP faculty? I know you mentioned that you really liked them. Um, did you have any specific relations with any of them or just them in general? Um, Dr. Briscoe. Um, I attend Victory Christian Assembly, and so him and his wife um, go to that church. His wife is an evangelist, um, and so having them as also a backbone here, um, again, IUP is not the most diverse place, and so I checked other churches, but when I met them, he's like my mentor. He was actually him and... Uh, I want to call him PJ, <laughs> Melvin Jenkins, Dr. Melvin Jenkins, who that is his church, but he oversees the VST. Um, they were part of my um, committee um, with Dr. Beeger, who is awesome. <laughs> he um, retired though. Um, but um, having the relationship I have with Dr. Briscoe and then PJ, um, it was good to, one, spirituality is important for me. So finding a church that if anybody has ever heard um, PJ or Melvin Jenkins um, give a speech, that's like, he's awesome at giving speeches. So it's like going to church for an awesome speech every Sunday and it's awesome. Um, and it's not long, you get in, you get out, I get a really good message. And so because of that, that also helped stabilize me and help give me like a place um, whereas I think if I didn't find a church home and um, Dr. Briscoe and his wife, they also have, they call it Agape is a Bible study group for um, older individuals. And so if you're in a graduate program, um, you can be in that because they have the undergraduate um, Bible studies on Friday at the church with PJ. Um, but also having that and meeting other um, individuals has helped me have at least somebody to talk to or somebody if I'm really going through something I can call one of them or go over to their house and be like okay I just need to talk in online right now um, whereas if I didn't have that I probably wouldn't have been here for that long or um, it wouldn't it wouldn't have been as I don't know, like I wouldn't have really wanted to be here that long um, and it's a little sad, and it, it, but like students, they can find other students. But as a professional who works here, I just wish there was more diversity on as not just young professionals too. Um, so like it's weird, like I'm not gonna go to Philly Street with some students and we oversee graduate students. Like that's not, you don't wanna blur lines or anything. So I just wish there was more young, diverse, professionals here um, where even if you look outside of like the diversity pool um, it's a lot of older individuals <laughs> too that have like husbands and wives and like kids I don't have none of that so if I'm like hey let's go to Pittsburgh and hang out or let's go to my husband like, okay well let me get a babysitter or let me see if my husband can watch the kids or something so those kind of things I think if IUP can just get that together it will bring more diverse individuals to this area okay um, so you kind of talked about how you perceive the community here at IUP how you long for more diversity um, how did you perceive uh, what was your perceived attitude towards clubs and other organizations um, as you're here because um, I know you talked about more of a professional kind of Mm -hmm. How do you view some of the clubs that, like, maybe your CAs are in, or...? Um, I think there is a lot <laughs> of organizations, at least for the students. So it's like, and then if you don't, if you don't see something you like, then it's encouraging the students to then create that club or create that organization. And so I like that there's a lot. Um... Yeah, I have my if-ands about some of the 
different orgs and like the level of um, expectations, I would say, um, that they're expected or like oversight. Um, that part has always bothered me since I got here with it's the diverse ones. There are certain ones that's like, no, uh, no, you need more guidance, you need men more mentorship, but it's almost like this is how it's always been. So, um, and again, the students, not sometimes they don't want that help. Um, but I like that there's a lot and people can get into things. I wish that they represented more um, and there was more of a, like you can see them more. Um, I, um, if you go around the campus, there are certain organizations that you always hear about, that they always have programs or some things to do or they're very active. Um, but there's some that I didn't even know existed and I still don't know exist unless I go online and I look and I'm like, okay, what have they ever done? I've never seen a flyer, I've never seen something. Um, and again, it goes back to the diversity issue. There's diverse groups like um, that are on campus, but I feel like their stuff is not publicized enough for others to know about it, enough to go to. Um, so that's, again, I just wish it was out there you can see um, and I and I wish that like the two biggest um, ones was BC and then uh, 10 collided and they're now they're static um, where I understand that that's a good thing I also wouldn't approve of that where it, at a predominantly white institution where this is there's a reason why BEC was created. Um, and even though a lot of the, the, because I asked about it, and even though the reasonings behind, well, a lot of the people in BEC were also on the board of 10, and they always collide, like uh, collaborated and worked together. So like, it's great that they merged together. Um, but my question back was, um, did anybody sit with them and say, even though this is great, I think it would have looked better saying, look at BEC working with 10, than now they're just one group because at the end of the day, to be honest, as time move on, the default always goes back to the white student population if there's a lot of students who are, um, I forget what the stats are, but they're like 80 something percent white students. It's not that that's what you want, but anybody who's studied diversity, study different things, and I do a lot, of, I do workshops and stuff. Um, if you're not careful and, and students don't understand what it means, like why there's a name, sometimes that draws a line after a certain part where unless you wrote it, wrote it in the constitution that you would be very vigilant about making sure that you reach out to um, diverse student populations to make sure that they are represented in the e-board that they were presented in the membership over time is going to fade away. And that's where I don't want to happen. And sometimes for our black students or our Asian students, them hearing Asian club or African American club or black emphasis committee, like hearing that says, if nothing else, if I don't see people who look like me, if I go to that, I'm going to see that. And so that's that's where I was just like, oh, no, sorry. That's fine. Um, but other than that, like, again, there's a lot of committees and clubs and stuff that students can get involved in. Well, picking back off of that, um, as in your position, RD, um, do you see any of your students, do you feel that some that might identify as minority groups, like these Asian students or black students, as you elaborated, do you think that they feel uh, excluded from certain clubs because as you said, like 80% of the students might be white? Um, um, or is there some sort of, I don't know, maybe mental barrier? I think, uh, okay, so when you look at situations when it comes to diversity, a lot of times, whether you knowing knowingly or not, you tend to draw closer to individuals who look like you and that you feel comfortable with. I think there's a book out there like, why do all the black kids sit in the same table at the cafeteria or something? Um, and I, um, when I did presentations, anytime when you talk about race and stuff, um, there was one time at a national co uh, uh, convention or 
uh, thing that I went to, I was doing a thing about colorism and race. It was funny because when people came in, they started separating themselves because it was like a row of chairs here, here, and then you can come down the aisle on either side. Um, all the white individuals who came in a room kind of grouped together. All the black individuals and Hispanics and stuff grouped together. And there was one black person where the white people were, one white person <laughs> on the other side. And like, before I started my presentation, I was like, let's stop and take a look around the room. And everybody was like, oh my God. No, they didn't do it on purpose. Um, but it, to help students of color, no matter who they are, to feel engaged, they need to see or hear themselves in other things because it's a cultural thing. Um, and so that might be the way to then get them into different things. But if you come in like the leadership doesn't look like you, most of the leadership doesn't look like you, most of the people around you don't look like you, um, the majority of the clubs and organizations that are there, again, you can't, it's just number, it's a numbers game. Um, they don't look like you. It's hard for freshmen, sophomores, whoever it is, people who don't know each other or out of their comfort zone to be like, okay, I'm gonna go out of my comfort zone, especially if they, they can't find a commonality. And so it, it's a human thing. If you walked into the room and nobody looked like you, let's say you walked into the room as all males, um, not white, or at least visibly don't look white, um, or what, you'll feel odd. You'll feel like, oh, okay, well, I'm just standing here in the corner. Unless you know somebody or you can find somebody that has something in common for you to like pick up a conversation. And so I think that's what it is until there is a deliberate shift in leadership where when people are hired and stuff like that, and it's hard to get people to move out here to Indiana, <laughs> but um, that's part of it too. But it's, it's a thing where it's it, like you have to push people out of their comfort zone. So even if you walk around and you see groups of students, they still s group themselves. And it's a comfort thing, especially if you don't know. Uh, so like you're finding out, oh, we're all from Philadelphia. Oh, we're from Altoona or Harrisburg or Erie. You'll find, like, they'll find each other. Ding, 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 like when they're tweeting out, like who's from here, who's from there. And then they group each other through that way. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a mental thing, but it's a human thing. Uh, did you personally experience any points in your life, either here, maybe at Rutgers, or when you moved to New Jersey, where you kind of walked in and you were like, nobody looks like me? Um, were you intimidated by that? Because I know you said New Jersey, you, it was significantly less diverse than it was in New York. Yeah. Um, especially when I started playing softball <laughs> and I decided to be a pitcher. Like, how many black pitchers do you know, period, um, that are out there? And actually, it was a girl... Shaniqua Pippen. Um, it was me seeing her pitch made me want to pitch. Because um, I was like, I've never seen a black pitcher. She's awesome. I got to be some of that awesomeness too. Um, but yeah, it, from New York to New Jersey where we were living, um, even though Camden wasn't far, um, it was a significant drop in diversity. Um, However, again, because I played basketball and I was on the basketball team that um, there was some diversity on the team. Um, but I've always been a floater, <laughs> if I can say that. So like for me, I never, because of growing up and dealing with people like students or other students bullying me because I didn't know how to speak the language and then it was oh you're African and different things like that it was I've just been a floater so like at one point was like hey do you know you're a public kid I was like I don't know I just talk to whatever and whoever I want to so for me when I moved down to Jersey I made sure that even though I was on the sports team I talked to like the goth kids I talked to the um there was like a group of students that always sat together because they were all deaf and I was like, okay, well, somebody's going to teach me something. So I would sit there with them and, like, I would want to learn that. But that was just my personality. And that's because I went through something and knew why I didn't want to be separated. 
And so I made sure that when I was in environments like that, that I talked to different people um, and I got to know different people, but that's not the case for everybody. Um, and so that's, I guess that's, yeah, I felt like, okay, I don't look like anybody, especially when I went to softball camp. Whew, I got a scholarship for pitching camp and everybody knew who they were, there was one black catcher and then I was the one black pitcher and everybody else was white. Um, and so it was funny because when my dad came and picked me up, it was just like, okay, you're either Nancy or the other girl's dad. But when my coach, Coach Sigurfuse, would come pick me up, they wouldn't know who he's talking about. I'm here to pick Nancy. I don't know who you're talking about. Um, there's a Nancy out there. He's like, no, that's not her. The black girl that's pitching. Oh, okay, Nancy, her. Um, but again, like I would walk in and I'd be like, mm, okay, well, I kind of expected it. So nothing I didn't feel too weird about it um but I can see other people feeling kind of weird about it here yeah it's again like I said I wish there was more a diverse group of staff and faculty that worked here um but hey it works out yeah it's even though I wish I know it, it is what it is, so I kind of, it is. So were you almost expecting uh, the almost like climate at IUP, at IUP to be like the one at New Jersey? Or were you expecting more diverse or less diverse when you came here? Um, because I worked at Centenary College, um, that was really like in the mountains somewhere and it was an equestrian school like so it was a top equestrian school in the country so you not only had student not a lot of black Hispanic Asian students um, you also had individuals who literally got ponies and horses for like birthday gifts so that was a different breed of students again um, but I saw that there was a separation and only because of the cost of housing and then how housing fell and so as a freshman they had two freshman halls um, then you had at the back of campus the new apartment style living which was more expensive middle campus you had a couple of halls but there was that sadly the the kids ended up calling it the ghetto because it was the cheapest place to live and two of the halls um, it was like the last place you wanted to live and so if you didn't have enough money in time if you signed up late which is typically because you didn't get your money until late you ended up there so a lot a large population which that's where I was placed too, um, a large population was the minority students in mid campus and then everybody else was everywhere else um, so it's here, well, if you want to say more students, there's more students here, but population-wise, if you want to say percentage-wise, it's about the same. Um, I, I don't, I didn't, I knew it was a predominantly white institution. It's not like, oh, I'm going to an HBCU, and I walked in, and it's like, whoa, whoa. Even though there are certain HBCUs that, like, 60% are like white students and then the rest is not. There are HBCUs like that. But um, like I was expecting it. Um, the town, how it is. Um, I know individuals who still deal with um, issues of race in the town when, it, when you want to uh, rent a space. Um, I have friends who still can't get spaces even though they know the space is empty. They've been told it's not empty, <laughs> it's occupied, but then other people that they know who are not um, black um, have gone and been able to see the space and stuff like that. So there's that around, which sadly, it doesn't surprise me. Um, but yeah, it, I, I expect it. Have you personally ever encountered any of this type of racism specifically towards you? Um, more microaggressions. Um, um, there's been certain phrases and certain things that people have used um, and said to me. Um, and it's always been a battle of, I don't want to say anything because if I do, then I'm the angry black woman. Um, and then there's been times that I felt like I can't like I can't do right 
only because it's like you also deal with even student staff who grew up in neighborhoods and have had bosses and like this is a culture shock for them to see like a black person then yet alone your supervisor is from black too okay where does that happen um and so i know it's a learning curve and for some of the students and so there's been times where it's like they don't know if they can talk to me or speak to me I'm like i haven't done anything and it's weird because like I can walk across the quad and for a period of time it was like why are you so mad I was like wait I'm not smiling I'm just walking from one end of campus to the other I'm just really focused and intent on wherever I'm going or I'm thinking to myself and but then it's like but if I was like just smiling for no reason you'd think I'm weird um so it's been that there's been um sometimes I've seen differences in how people receive others um Sometimes, like, I've met individuals who were white who kind of had the same temperament and attitude as me, but they were given the benefit of a doubt, and I wasn't. Um, and so there's been those things where, again, I, I'm like, I have a list of things, and if I wanted to grieve or, like, you know, do all that stuff, I'm like, I could do it, but then I'll be this. Um, so sometimes you just swallow it and you just keep going um and even in black sap or black student affairs professionals there's always like well, don't forget to put your mask on today um and it's just like people say things to you not thinking how you're going to feel or do things or assume things about you and you can't really do much about it because it's like okay it's out of ignorance or you just don't care um but i'm just gonna try to play it off and just go about doing my whatever I need to do. Um, so yeah, there's been those situations here with people making comments or saying stuff or treating me different. Um, it hasn't happened all the time, but when they have happened, it's like, oh, okay, all right. Just, just gonna walk away right now and just walk away. You kind of deal with it and keep moving. It's just, I don't know, you just deal with it. <laughs> um. So would you feel that the IEP community is more inclusive towards people of color or more exclusive because of some of these instances, or maybe it's more of a situational type of thing? I think in order to be truly inclusive, um, and it's not going to be cheap, and it's not going to be easy, everybody has to be on board with it and of course like you're not going to say oh indiana town let's like try to teach inclusive and like please accept all of us including the college students because it's like we don't want them like they pay for your stuff um but within iup and i think it's great that we have a mission statement and stuff but there it needs to be backed up and at this point, it's like, oh, we don't have enough money to do this, so we're going to, okay, I understand. But then are we really being inclusive? Are we really tackling these issues, um, how they should be tackled? Um, so, yeah, there's been talk about it. Um, I think IUP does a better job talking about it or writing about it more than actively like moving and and it's going to take every department doing that um being aware of even like pictures and stuff that they post online or to represent their department um so it, it's just one of those things where i think iup can do better um when it comes to diversity inclusion issues i know several years ago because of certain comments that was made to lgbtqia like there was this Think, like the students and some faculty members were like protesting how the hour went. <laughs> I was like, yes. Um, I was out there with them. Um, um, but I think it's also easier sometimes to deal with that than it is to deal with race. And sometimes people are scared to say that. Um, 
yet there's battles in different situations when you talk about LGBTQIA issues um, and race issues. Um, but one thing, like I know some, somebody said a quote or something like, at the end of the day, I can choose to tell you if I'm part of the LGBTQIA um, group, but I can't hide the fact that I'm black. I can't hide the fact that I'm Hispanic or Asian. Or, like that's something that whether I want to tell you or not, you're going to know and you're going to treat me accordingly to that. Um, you can assume all you want about my sexuality, but unless I tell you, you don't know. Um, so do we have more resources for students of color? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Is there a place where I can go and say I can talk to somebody specifically about this? I don't think so. We have safe zone. I'm part of it, you know. Um, but is there kind of like a safe zone for students of color? No, there isn't. Um, I know they're doing the whole thing with, I think more so faculty has like a plan on how to get more um, professors of color to come to IUP, but there isn't a plan. And I only know this because like, I think my, Pablo Mendoza, when I had a presentation on race on campus and different things like that, um, I was the interim director at the African American Cultural Center before they changed the name um, this past year. Um, but it was said like the administration doesn't have an active plan of this is what we're doing when it comes to this area, but faculty does, and at least they have a plan. And once people are allowed to like hire and different things like that, let's see how that plays out. And I know it's also hard because telling individuals like if I had a difference, if I had to choose between IUP being settled in Indiana, Pennsylvania, and IUP being settled probably near a, a city or Atlanta or somewhere else I want to go there <laughs> than to come to Indiana so it's just ah it's just a circle I'm just chasing tails yeah um okay I know that you said you worked a lot of jobs to get yourself through Rutgers um would you like to elaborate on some of the jobs that you did and how you worked um and just how much time did you have to allocate towards those jobs and your classes in regards to would you put work above classwork or no. <laughs> um uh different times i worked as a resident assistant and that took care of my room board um as the same thing here and then we got a paycheck every other week um for like less than a hundred dollars but it was a paycheck um and it took care of my meals. And then I worked the security job out of the police department, which was the highest paying job on campus. And that was $11 an hour. I was like, yes, Lord. I was in there, I was a rover. And that's when you write, you handle the van. So anytime a student from, because it was in Camden, um, it was part of like if students wanted a ride to the train station or back from the train station, or if you needed to do a run for the police officers, that that's what you would do unless you're, and then I would give people breaks, other security guards breaks. Um, so I did that. And then because of the RA and working, excuse me, and working with, um, President's life, I was able to also work through um, student activities. And so that afforded me the opportunity to just see different things, but also get involved on campus. And then like in the summers, I'll do random like stuff for like, there was a, a staff member in financial aid and she was so helpful with me, like giving me the information that I need to like sign up for what loans and like to get, um, grants and different things she was like you might you want to get your letter in you like she really helped me out and so like every summer she would run like um a tennis program really quick so i'll come take pictures and help clean up and set up and different things like that and so it just it helped me get involved because i had no other choice um um but later on i think i did the ch job for two years and then in the summers i would also stay i would from the first day I stepped on campus as an undergrad, I've never moved off campus. As an RD, I, I still live here. Um, I still live on campus. Um, 
And so in the summers, I will work with housing. I did um, the summer camps and then any other odd jobs and things that they needed in the office. I was just always working. And that's the one thing I appreciate about them because they were always, they knew I was in need. And so like they would let me know of different opportunities and I'll be able to work for where I lived because I couldn't afford it. <laughs> couldn't afford it. And to come out with still over $100,000 in loans. Yeah, it's not fun. Out of state is not a, a good feeling <laughs> for them. But yeah. So you said you only ever lived on campus. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that shaped your experience rather than doing the usual live on campus for a year or two, then move off campus? Um, it helped me be engaged and it's because I worked on campus as well. Um, and so having that paid for helped me not have to stress about that. Um, and be, uh, it also helped me keep focus. So not to say like as an undergrad, I never had fun and went to parties. No, I was just really, I planned everything. I would get my syllabus, I would write out, and I, I think I like I saved like a piece of my, <laughs> like my, uh, my schedule once and I, and I found it one day, I think when I was moving, I was like, what? Did I do with my life but I would plan everything I would go through my it actually kept me focused so I would go through all my syllabus I'll write down everything that's due and when it's due and I would do it ahead of time and because you're an RA or CA here um, you had times that you were on duty then you had to do programming and then you had to do other things and then I had other jobs so I planned everything when I'm working and then when it came to like parties and stuff I was always the person like I didn't want to party where I worked because no I'm not going to do that I'm not going to ruin my chances on everything that's going on um, at that time that's when Facebook started popping up <laughs> and so Believe it or not, that's where they would put all the parties going on in different schools or events um, that I wanted to go to. So it wasn't always parties, but like events. And so I would go and then I would pencil in like, oh, OK, I can get my paper done. And then this weekend I'm not working or I'll be done by work at this time. Like, hey, can you go? Whatever. And then we will plan. So I got to still experience college life, but it was just planned and focused. Um, yeah, that was, that was my college experience. Okay, um, shifting gears back to what you said at the beginning, um, I know that you said that you were looking for to move on to another job after IUP. Mm -hmm. What do you envision for your future? Um, my ultimate goal at the end of this is, at first I said I wanted to be a president of a university. Um, but i rather vice president of student affairs, Rhonda Lucky, that's me, um, because um, I feel like with a president, like you're, you're about making money, having these meetings or whatever. And like, even though with the presidents that I've met and the VPs that I've met and gotten to know, I feel like they got a little wiggle room that they can still see a student um, or come to an event where the president makes some, some events, but um, they can still kind of find ways to work a bit more with the student. Like, it's harder for me to be like, I'm going to go see the president. But I know I can email Dr. Lucky and be like, okay, even if it's a couple weeks down the road, like, come and see me, talk to me. Um, and so my end goal would be vice president of student affairs. Um, my next role out of here because I'm really passionate about diversity, race issues and stuff. I do want to, and I've been looking heavily at diversity deputy di diversity officer or uh, chief diversity officer or multicultural. I love being at the multicultural center, um, just different stuff like that. But I also love housing. And so um, I've been applying for like the next step up, which is director of housing. Uh, or depending on how it is, different places like Dean of Student of Housing, something like that. So if I stay in housing, definitely moving up and then making my way to the VP section um, as time goes on. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm looking for as my next role. And because of that, I'm actually right now working on a workshop, a diversity workshop for professors. Um, that's supposed to happen 
mm-hmm. next week. Hopefully they're not on strike so I can actually have the diversity workshop with them. Um, but I've been working with RJCC, um, Racial Justice Coalition, or some, I don't, it's really long. Um, but I've been working with them and um, I created a, like a five hour workshop just to go through like diversity issues and how to make the classroom, one, make the professors more aware of these are the stats and these are how students of color may be feeling um, on campus and then maybe in your, in your, in your classroom. How can you better um, create a more welcoming environment for these students? And how could you care for that? And what happens when there's tough conversations and to- tough topics that come in your classroom? Like, how do you ta- um, tackle that? And um, just letting them know, like, it's like standardized testing is not really standard for all students who take it. Like, how's your syllabus? Is it welcoming? Is it um, gender neutral when you like look at the wording? Different things to be aware of. So I'm really excited about it, and I really hope they're not on strike, <laughs> so I can do, so I can have that workshop. And they're planning on actually developing into more like a workshop series for them. So I'm excited about that. That's awesome. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share that you feel is important to you, your childhood, your identity, or anything that makes up just who you are? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. I think what what makes me who I am, I would say, is uh, the fact that I got to start off the way I did, like not knowing the language and like being bullied and different things and then just transitioning into doing things because I think that and my family ethics and being an African, <laughs> at least Ghanaian I could say, like we're very big on education. Um, so like getting my education, being really focused, sometimes and I will say sometimes I'm like, hey, why can I fool off like the rest of the world? But I'm like, no, it's okay. I don't need that in my life. But I would say having the family base that I, I have, um, the culture that I grew up with, um, that definitely shaped my identity. Um, and my experiences, of course, shaped my identity to who I am. So when I get to engage and talk to students and like work with them, is like, okay, student athlete, yeah, check, did that arts and theater check with that like I, because of those various things I'm able to connect with more students so it's not like okay this is just my experience and this is how it's been so it's it's I can't relate to you I can't relate to you no I'll find a way to relate to you we're gonna have a good conversation um, kind of thing so I'm very even though sometimes it was tough um, I'm very proud of everything that brought me to this part, um, brought me to this point, so that I can be more understanding of students coming in. Um, so yeah, and I'm glad that IUP was a part of that. Like the people that I've met here, um, the education that I got here, um, I'm very happy that I got to experience that. My professors, um, my coworkers, just that experience helped make me who I am today. And so even though I'm looking to move on to the next phase of my career, um, I'm happy that I got to experience this and got to experience the various different areas and departments and individuals here because good or bad, it still shaped me and it helped me like to my next step. So that's about it. Awesome. Uh, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think we've covered pretty much okay. what we need to. All right. So-